Now our next presenter, um, oh, who just popped up. I saw her and, and there she is. There she is, great, is Devorah Gren. She's a PhD. She's a Kohenet, that is a Hebrew priestess. She's the founding director of the Lilith Institute in operation since 1997. Congratulations. Um, she co-directed the former Women's Spirituality Master's Degree Program at the Institute of Transpersonal Psychology, also known as Sophia University, and she founded Mishkan Shakina, a movable sanctuary honoring the sacred feminine in all traditions. Devorah leads the Institute's Lilith Fire Circle, and she also serves as a spiritual mentor and guide. Her Talking to Goddess anthology includes sacred writings of 72 women from 25 different traditions. Her dissertation, For She is a Tree of Life, Shared Roots Connecting Women to Deity, studied beliefs and rituals amongst Southern African Lemba Jewish women. Her other pub publications include Lilith's Fire, Reclaiming Our Sacred Life Force, the Kohanat, Keepers of the Flame, in Stepping Into Ourselves, an anthology of writing on priestesses, and the Jewish Priestess and Lilith entries in the Encyclopedia of Women in World Religions. Welcome, Devorah of the Lilith Institute here today to shed light on Lilith. Thank you. Thank you so much, Yeshe, for this invitation and uh, specifically gratitude to you just for everything you create, including the genius of the Goddess Temple app. <laughs> so I'm just going to start with this for a moment uh, before I share screen and uh, hopefully the sound will work all right. All my settings are, let me just double check that I have, yeah, original sound is on. Just to bring us in, of course, we're already in sacred space and very deeply after that wonderful guided meditation. I just bring this in as a way of, again, connecting us to other aspects of the mother, to our own heartbeats and the collective heartbeat in this circle. Give thanks and praise to the ancestors on whose shoulders we stand. I call in the mother line, the grandmother line, the great grandmother lines, and especially Rita Cobgren, my mother of blessed memory, Dr. Mildred Sabbath and Kay Schumann, Hannah, Eleanor, and Greta, and Verena, and Regina. Michelle. So if you wouldn't mind to uh, let me share screen. Then yes, should be clear to go. Okay, and then just please let me know if I need to make it larger once we do this. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> it might be nice if it could be a little larger, if that's possible, just so we can read it. Yeah. Okay, and it's, uh, it doesn't matter what I see on my screen in terms of how many faces, right? That's correct. You, in fact, you probably shouldn't see us. You'll just see your screen and maybe okay. even yourself. Okay, because I do want to try to look at people, but I'm also reading, so you know that challenge. Okay, so let's see. We will play it from here. And uh, please bear with me. Uh, sometimes the machine has a mind of its own. And, and so we'll skip forward or backward without any prompting from me. 
So we're meeting Lilith today. Many of you, of course, already know of her and uh, looking at her as the first resistor, invoking her for transformation and liberation. And this is obviously in, in 25 minutes or 20 minutes. And you'll give me a five minute warning, right, Yeshe? Yep. Okay. Thank you. Um, it's a, it has to be by necessity, very brief introduction to this first woman, first feminist. But I hope to stimulate our thinking around questions like how and why has she been demonized for thousands of years? How does that impact us today? How are women still ostracized or punished for embodying her qualities today? And what can we learn from her about taking risks, finding voice, moving through our fears, becoming independent and self-authorized, insisting on freedom, claiming our true identities, and celebrating our sexuality or sexualities? And just to give a, a little uh, background on where we find the first mentions of her is in this area, especially in Mesopotamia here between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers and throughout the Fertile Crescent. Babylon and what is now, of course, Iran and Iraq, that area, and another, just another view of that. Or in Nippur, you've, you've heard about it. Um, and so we're talking about, uh, if, if we're looking at the worship of, of let's say, uh, Inanna, that perhaps goes back to 4000 BCE, 6000 years ago, I think that uh, Lilith as an aspect of her, which is a possibility, uh, we could maybe date back to then, or at least to 3,000 or so. And so in, in the British Museum, here she is. And I have to tell you that when I went there in 2005, after doing a conference in Liverpool, I found my way to the ancient Near East section. I don't know how, I didn't ask directions. I went right there, and she's the first thing I saw. And I burst into tears. <laughs> And I think scared the security people. There were two of them. And I didn't stay too near her case because I thought they probably were wondering what on earth is this crazy woman going to do? But I wept for half an hour. And that's the impact that she has always had on me since I first met her in 85, which I'll talk about in a bit. And so they call her Queen of the Night. They say it may be a Reshkigal, Inanna's sister, but they don't call her Lilith. There are many names we might know her by that they don't specify. Uh, this is the dating uh, of uh, this find and uh, made out of clay and found in an ancient creche. So if that was in a home, clearly she was, or wherever it was, she was worshipped in some way as a goddess. I look at her, since I've done my thesis on her in 98, as possibly being an aspect of Inanna and Ishtar, because there's been some controversy uh, that in around the 80s or so, maybe early 90s, they said scholars changed their opinion about who this was and decided it wasn't Lilith, but it was Inanna. And so every so often I'll have you know somebody say, oh no, that you're wrong, or they'll say, but isn't she Inanna, or isn't she Ishtar? To me, this figure will always be Lilith because that's how I first came to her, how she was first introduced to me. And of course, if they're all aspects of one and we know that the goddess is she of 10,000 names, then what are we talking about? And what do we argue about anyway? We're talking about a set of energies, right? We're talking about a, a force of nature. Um, and so here they call her a highly composite Mesopotamian goddess. And she's been called a witch, a demoness after being thought of as a goddess and associated in many cultures, blamed for men's night dreams, their wet dreams, child stealing or worse. The mountain here represents the cosmos. If you'll see these little uh, octagons under her feet, under the lion. And uh, Dr. Judy Gran, a cultural theorist and, and well-known and beloved poet, who many of you know and writer, uh, thinks that this rod and ring she's holding in her hands may be measuring tools signifying her control of agriculture. They are also the rod and ring of Sumerian royal authority. And royal or divine status is also often signified by the type of horned or serpentine crown that she's wearing. We also see it on male figures and other female deities, or certainly on Inanna, Ishtar, and, and Lilith. The British Museum wanted to replicate how she was actually found, and so that's why we have this figure painted red, white, and black. Uh, that's how uh, Henri Frankfort writes about her uh, at, at the initial find uh, and thinking then, I guess there were enough traces for them to make that supposition, but the, you know, you see her 
figure as she stands today in this in this plainer uh, terracotta uh, coloring, but it really doesn't matter. In fact, I think she loses something with this coloring, although I know that red ochre has a lot of significance. Um, this, I think this, um, this other figure, here it goes again, on the left uh, is very powerful in its own right. The symbols surrounding her, of course, then represent not only divine power, but supernatural wisdom, access to secret knowledge, knowledge of the mysteries, death, and the underworld. And so we have the owls who represent both death and wisdom, according to your beliefs. And uh, we have her uh, surrounded by them and again, accompanied by, protected perhaps by the, her vehicle of lions. So she also have a, has a connection, of course, to death for many reasons and to the underworld. And um, that's also present in both the Inanna and the Ishtar descent myths. Her nakedness identifies her as a symbol of eroticism as well as fertility. And so one question I, I had as I was preparing this was just to ask, so how, as, as I've asked many times and many people have asked me, how did we move from this powerful figure, this goddess, this deity rec recognized as such to someone re recognized and regarded as a demon? And of course, I think it's in the patriarchal reframings. They couldn't tame her, so they had to tear apart her character. They had to call her a child killer and all the other things I've already mentioned. They tried to erase her, but as with other embodiments of the sacred feminine, they didn't succeed in stopping her worship. And we know that because, first of all, they're afraid enough of her to try to keep her out through the use of amuletic devices. Um, but also we know that in the case of of many, many goddesses, and the goddess, and goddess without the in front of her, is worshipped in many ways. We find it in the material culture, in the ground. We find evidence, and we find more every year. So she was alive, but we didn't hear about it so much because she was worshipped in folk religion. And the canon that was practiced in the ancient temple and the more less slightly less ancient church uh, worshipped and, and, and uh, privileged, I want to say, uh, a male, singular male deity when we had monotheism come in. In many cases, they did succeed for a time in alienating us from our true nature, from identifying with ourselves as a force of nature, but, uh, and in causing us to suspect and malign other women instead of supporting and collaborating with each other. But I think th those days are behind us, at least I hope so, and certainly a lot of us are doing that work of breaking down the patriarchy and creating new systems and supporting and inventing a paradigm shift that we're in the middle of. In contemporary writings, Eleanor Gaiden and Vicki Noble have talked about her as a protective force that women called on in childbirth. And why has she fascinated me since I first learned of her? I was always a rebel. For one thing, I had an authoritative father and later a controlling husband. So I was, again, thinking about this this week. And I knew I was going to tell you that when I first heard about her in a class, I'd never heard of her. I was delighted. I was inspired. I was hungry to learn every single thing I could learn about her. It gave me hope and reassurance to know that there was another way of being. When I gave this more deep thought this week, I thought, well, I have to talk about this because it's a piece of it. Being in an abusive marriage, to see a larger than life archetypal figure who fled a situation in which she was dominated, in which her voice didn't matter, resonated very strongly with me. And she's never left my consciousness. Somehow she got a little bit submerged because I went back into corporate life and I still don't know how I managed to do that after being introduced to her, but I did. And, um, not till about 10 years later did she rise to the forefront of my work and my consciousness again when I was a master's student and decided that she would be the topic of my work, which became the book Lilith's Fire, reclaiming our sacred life force, because she is life force. One of the meanings of her name is wind as well, uh, but definitely a force of nature. We find her in Hebrew and Jewish texts, such as the Hebrew Bible or Old Testament, in the first of two versions of Genesis, the creation story, the one that says male and female created he them, lets us assume or suppose that Lilith and Adam were made from what Cozy Fabian of blessed memory called the same bloody clay, made from the same earth. 
As her image became worsened over time, and we got to Kabbalistic texts in 12th, 13th century, they were saying she was made from filth and sediment instead of the earth or the bloody earth or bloody clay. So that's one place that we think she appeared in the Bible. But the, the other one that everybody would recognize in some form is in Isaiah 34, 14, where one translation says, the desert creatures will meet with hyenas and one wild goat will call to another. There the night creature will settle and find her place of repose. But it really paints a picture, a, a, an apocryphal, uh, a, 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 sorry, apocalyptic, not apocryphal, <laughs> apocalyptic uh, image, a day of judgment kind of scenario. Whether or not her name in there represents Lilith as a female figure with a capital L or a Lilith, small l, which is a generic demon, we don't know. It's all a matter of conjecture, like so much of this, and even the, the dating of, of all of this. Uh, the Talmud, which are texts that interpret the Torah uh, and are among the top Jewish sacred texts, uh, from 200 to 500 CE, where it was first written, uh, spoken, oral arguments, and then written down. Uh, in Midrash, in retellings, reinterpretations, similar to what would be called in, in Christian tradition, exegesis, where you're interpreting pieces of the Bible. In Agadah, in folk tales and legends, is where she really comes alive. In the Talmud is where we see the greatest, I think, uh, warnings about her. Like, if you see her, make sure you immediately cross the street. Uh, many, many, many worse things are said about her. And that uh, continues in the Zohar, the primary Kabbalistic text, and in a range of medieval and contemporary literature, art, poetry, and song. And as depicted in the Christian Bibles, I did a comparison once of that passage in Isaiah, because I was just curious. And as you see, there's a tremendous diversity of ways that this force or this figure is, is referred to as a night owl, night specter, which usually might mean a ghost, right? Night monster, vampire, which is a very popular characterization of Lilith in sci-fi and in, and in uh, some settings today in art. Uh, night hag, Lilith with the capital L and with a small L, night creature in, uh, in these various uh, versions of, of the New Testament, a night jar and night bird. So who was she? What is, what is her story for those who may not be familiar? On the left, I thank Lillian Broca so much for creating this Lilith series over 20 years ago. And, uh, and here we have Adam and Eve being created from the earth together at the same time. So what I wrote about in Lilith's Fire is that she's a mythical figure of the dark goddess, one aspect, as we know, uh, of many uh, references to a dark goddess, a symbol of the independent, rebellious, sensual, courageous, passionate, and rageful potential in all of us, but righteous rage. She's been a source of inspiration and a flame igniting my curiosity since 1985. According to Jewish legend, she was Adam's first wife and Eve's predecessor. In the most commonly told version of the tale, she's made from the same earth as Adam, and for this reason refuses to lie beneath him sexually. When he insists, she mutters God's secret name and flies out of the Garden of Eden. Has had enough, she said. I'm, that's it. I'm going. She goes off to live her own life at the shores of the red, then called Reed Sea. So the story goes on to say that Adam complained to God, who then sent three angels, Sanoi, Sansanoi, Samangaloth, to get, get her, bring her back to Eden. And she refused. And they threatened her. They said, and again, there are several versions of this. They either said, if you don't come back, you'll have a hundred demon children a night, or you'll have all your children each night will die, or you'll become barren. That's the least popular, I think, of the, of the translations. She finally, they went back and forth, negotiated, and she finally said, okay, if you put my name on an amulet, on, on some semblance of uh, fabric, what has become fabric or metal or different ways of making amulets, I will leave that baby alone. And so now most common language in amulets is to call in Adam and Eve and say, out Lilith. So, the amulets naming her 
show the concern, especially you can imagine 3,000 years ago in ancient Mesopotamia, even more of a concern, although it's still a concern in many countries today, with stillborn, children being stillborn, uh, various forms of death at or shortly after childbirth, uh, SIDS and other ailments, and later um, there we see the association uh, also to keep her away from sleeping men. And yet, Many contemporary women see in her the embodiment of the goddess. For example, as a goddess of love and war, she shares that designation with Inanna to, to some degrees and to the Semitic Akkadian Ishtar. Also, some similarities with the Canaanite or Hebrew goddess Anat, Egypt's Isis, the Carthaginian Tanit, and the Hindu Kalima. She's both demonized and desired for her wildness and independence. And we know that as the Madonna whore complex and, and you know, and, and the slut shaming and so on, uh, the stud and slut, you know, what behavior is acceptable for men and is not for women. She embodies nature itself, making male control of her impossible. Ishtar began as a powerful deity figure, as we know, and then was reduced to a rather one dimensional figure as a whore. So if we trace Lilith's development and the way she's persisted in the human imagination, I have to bring in the incantation bowls. Uh, first, we see her in the third millennium story of Gilgamesh and the Hulupu tree. She's referred to in the Hulupu tree in the Inanna literature as the dark maid Lilith, as somewhat threatening, but she is thought and interpreted uh, certainly by Judy Gran and Betty Deshong Metter and others who have worked on this material for 40 years. She's thought to represent the maiden Inanna's puberty and development, primal nature, sexuality, and psychological and physical development. There's a 2400 BCE text referring to a Sumerian storm demon, which could be her, could also be a male demon. And by the way, demons could be both beneficial and not so good in, in those times. In Babylonian legends dating from 1800 BCE or so, and again, the, the female in Genesis, possibly, very likely. She's mentioned in the Dead Sea Scrolls, even, and in rabbinic literature, as I mentioned, such as Talmud and folklore. In 15th and 16th century medieval times, in European sculpture and woodcuts, we see not very flattering references to her. In Kabbalistic sources, as I mentioned, and appearing through the 17th century CE in literature carrying through to the present day. So the bowl on the left, I'll show you more about in a minute, but I wanted to include this one because although we can't see it very well, you can, I hope, see the hair coming out of her head. So long hair is part of how we know it is probably her and certainly a female figure. Um, and also the way her arms are crossed and the circle she is within are forms of binding. And the hope was that you would bind a demon so they couldn't come out and, uh, and do something bad to you in your home or in, at your business, and I'll tell you more in a minute. But this is one more I wanted to share with you where you can very clearly uh, see the image and not so clear what she is bound by, but you can see a kind of a shackle right down here on her feet and uh, cr across her arms and the hair. And we know that the hair is often a threatening sign. Um, and I want to say threatens male fragility. Uh, we see that very clearly in the rules of uh, many Orthodox Jews, both, well, I guess around the world, but especially in Jerusalem, where women who are trying to pray at the Wailing Wall, uh, women of, of all different beliefs uh, within Judaism, different branches, are harassed beyond belief for over 30 years now. There's a group called Women of the Wall who still manage to sneak in the sacred scrolls, the Torah, so that young women can have a bat mitzvah rite of passage at the wall. Women are forbidden to bring a Torah in and are not supposed to sing and, that is and chant the prayers because that is considered threatening to men. The same is true of long hair and so Orthodox women, not so true for modern Orthodox who have shed some of these customs, but uh, a strict Orthodox woman would have to have her hair covered out of modesty once she gets married. And you can only take off your hat or your scarf or your wig at home with your husband at night. Um, so we have this, th these are called both demon and incantation bowls. And I started to put, you know, that it's to bind Lilith, but then I couldn't help but add the word attempting because I don't think 
I would imagine a lot of the attempts were not successful, uh, just as banishing or banning, um, you know, a certain activity of women and, and speech, and certainly what Kat Shaw shared of being banned by Facebook because her, her beautiful images are too uh, down to earth, are too real. Uh, and yet it's the nude female body, but it's not in a pornographic context, and so it gets banned. I mean, there's something so wrong and beyond ironic about that, isn't it? So these bowls are found around 200, 600 CE in Babylonia, uh, Iraq, what is now again, Iraq, Iran, and other places. I have a strong intuition that they were, they were being made before 200, uh, but we don't yet have proof. And what we have here, circular, you can't see it here because it's so tiny and so, and so smeared. I think I have it in the next slide. Not yet. Okay. Um, let me just see it here. Here you can better see that there is writing around the bowl. And these were incantations. These were prayers to keep, uh, to keep evil away. So who made the bowls and how were they used? Most likely priestesses, witches, male and female, sorcerers, sorceresses, magicians, rabbis, diviners, real and pseudo, not so real, healers uh, by other names were creating these bowls. They had an apotropaic or amuletic function to prevent, to be protective, to avert negative consequences or the evil eye, uh, negative energies or attention from a demon so that you would have a house that was safe, for example. Um, these were often, somebody would be commissioned to make this for a family or a specific individual, often when they were moving into a new house. Also used when somebody's starting a new business or to fight uh, and, and divert energies if you were sick to help you get well and so on. Uh, to divorce someone from Lilith or from other demonic forces, that, that word was used. Um, and of course to bring good luck and as I say to call in blessings for a new home, uh, success, adventure, uh, good health, relief, probably to invoke pregnancy if someone was having trouble getting pregnant and so on. One more sample. These are actually quite small, by the way. Um, I rushed right past them. Years ago, I had the chance to go to a, a conference uh, uh, with Mandaeans, um, and that was at Harvard Divinity School, so I had a chance to go to the Semitic Museum, and I went right past the, it, it, it was part of the exhibit, I went right past the first case because they're quite small. Um, let me just see. I'll give you some idea. This is not one. Uh, this is another, just one of my ritual bowls, but just to give you an idea of the size. But held great power. Uh, three scripts are commonly found in the bowls. Uh, Proto or, or Paleo-Hebrew probably. Uh, Aramaic script, Syriac, and Mandaean. And in both Jewish and Mandaean bowls, the name of Jesus can be found mentioned among other auspic auspicious names, both divine and angelic, because you'd be calling in all different sources for protection. In Christian bowls, one might find no mention of Jesus, but rather an invocation to deities, both male and female. And that's from the Penn Museum, which has its own wonderful collection. This is one from 7th century CE in Judeo-Aramaic. The inscription calls upon the removal of the child-killing Lilith demon. This was for a family or an individual who believed that she actually killed children. Joanne Skurlock, who's affiliated with the University of Chicago, told me years ago it's the male Lilu demon, L-I-L-U, who were responsible for killing and Lilith more for kidnapping possibly or making children sick. And there's a story that says she says that to the angels who were trying to bring her back to the garden, that she was put here to make babies sick. Um, and one could ask why, but of course, it, then we get into the whole discussion of the balance of life. And um, I, it makes me think of the story that um, I've often heard from uh, both Judy Gran and Diane Jeanette about goddess Kali, Bhadra Kali, Bhagavati, she of many names, uh, from their research in Kerala, India, when they once came back and said, similar to the male monotheistic god that, that we grew up, many of us grew up with. She gives smallpox, she can take it away, and she is the smallpox. So that last line always 
just throws me into a place where I wish I had, you know, six years to contemplate this in, you know, in a monastic environment. Uh, what does that mean? You know, that she is the smallpox. But um, any case, uh, so I think of that sometimes when I when I hear this or read this that Lilith said that she's here to bring illness to children. So. Here, this particular bowl mentions its client serving a writ of divorce, called a get, to the demon for its permanent removal, and continues by discussing the validity of the Jewish laws of divorce in regard to demons. So apparently there were laws on the books, so to speak, about this. And so I wanted to give you one example of a text, and this is from a Persian bowl in this Midic Museum, and it's, and it's even partial, this one. You are bound and sealed, all you demons and devils and liliths, plural, so here in the generic form, by that hard and strong, mighty and powerful bond with which are tied Sison and Sisim. The evil Lilith, who causes the hearts of men to go astray and appears in the dream of the night and in the vision of the day, who burns and casts down with nightmare, attacks and kills children, boys and girls. She is conquered and sealed away from the house and from the threshold of Baram Gushnasp, son of Ishtar Nahid, by the talisman of Metatron, the great prince who is called the great healer of mercy, who vanquishes demons and devils, black arts and mighty spells, and keeps them away from the house and threshold of Baram Gushnasp, son of Ishtar Nahid. Amen, amen, selah. Which was, of course, a way of sealing the words. So some things to think about. What are common demonizations or characterizations, not just of Lilith, but of Eve? Slut, bitch, uppity, bad wives, too radical, troublemakers, and I had to write, yes, thank you, <laughs> because of course, to many of these things, uh, also being accused of being, you know, weird or rebel, you know, as, as a woman growing up today in the modern culture, you know, these are things like Ani DeFranco's song years ago, who said, you say bitch like it's a bad thing. You know, I think I think some of these are things that we want to uh, not only uh, accept, uh, but uh, claim. The patriarchy's treatment of Lilith has been similar to its treatment of Eve. Both have been demonized, Lilith for her independence, free thinking, self-determined sexuality, and Eve for her quest for knowledge, her so-called disobedience. Both of them for the connections to wild nature, held as inferior to reason the spirit versus matter question. What are the consequences for both women and men in your view? And what damage do we do to each other if we perpetuate and sustain these archetypes? Well, we see it in the power of carrying on negative myth. Creation and other myths, folklore, legends, folk tales are foundational, as we know, by any name to every culture. Which ones have persisted over time? There seems to be a variation of a, a female demon, a hag, a child-stealing witch in many, many cultures. And often this is very closely connected to wanting to keep away the evil eye. The fear of the dark goddess, which has now fortunately been reclaimed by a number of writers and scholars. Um, uh, God is a Black Woman, Christina Cleveland's book. Um, I want to mention Lucia Chavala. Chavala. Birnbaum, Black Madonnas, and Dark Mother uh, are, are just a couple of the works that show how we all, first of all, come from Africa, how the Dark Mother is the originating mother, perhaps, uh, or original mother. And there's, that's a lot of wonderful work, which I can't even go into. Mary Beth Mosier has also uh, done extraordinary work. Um, and she and uh, Lucia were on tour uh, sort of a pilgrimage uh, years ago to um, to Italy and France, I think, and Spain over different years, and they would find actual black Madonnas, as other women have, and they would even find some that had been painted over white and, and the black one relegated to a back room in a church. So uh, the, that work is, is very important. Um, underscores the importance of us writing our own stories. If we're living on these as foundational stories, negative myths, including uh, Eve's disobedience as having brought 
made humankind mortal, first of all, as having gotten us thrown out of the Garden of Eden, as being responsible for pain in childbirth and menstruation as a quote-unquote curse. Uh, that, as a, as a basic story, is not, I think, one we want to keep raising our children on. And so it underscores for me the importance of writing our own stories and creating new myths and origin stories. Uh, again, thanks to Lillian Broca for this image of Lilith the demon, and you'll find many other amazing images on her website. And just uh, one last thing, how she lives on through women's eyes. This is a, obviously a very abstract um, version from uh, Wendy Rabinowitz, also of blessed memory. Uh, Lilith, queen of the dark force, she called this, and she said, Lilith regarded herself as Adam's equal, and when he refused to share power, she fled, raging out of the Garden of Eden. Contemporary Jewish feminists consider her symbolic of women who claim their rightful power and equality, and how they are then dismissed, thwarted, or rejected, but who transform their anger into positive creative energy. By claiming her light, Lilith became whole and holy. And thanks to Wendy for that. So I'm going to uh, pause here before I do my last minute uh, for any questions and answers. And I see there's some chat. Uh, okay, I don't know that that's, that's not yet to me. Okay, I won't. I, I have one uh, just little comment I, I'd love to offer, if I may. Yeah. Um, Devora, it's so great, this work that you've done researching, especially these bowls and other apotropaic um, talismanic things. And I think it's really important for us to note how one of the tactics in ancient um, war was to go, if you were one of the colonizers, was to go to the religious center of the people that you were trying to conquer and to literally cut the faces off their statues or break up their statues and turn them to rubble. And I think about how Lilith seems to have been relegated to the stone rubble pile of a more patriarchal Judaism and later Christianity, but how she doesn't really just let herself stay there and how important it is for us as women historians and researchers to go back to those rubble piles, especially to go you know, where there's trouble, where there's a troublesome woman, go research because you're gonna find some power there. That's Absolutely. Very important. Yeah, like with Medusa, which Girl God Books did a wonderful series about. How much time do I have? We're just about at time here, but if you want to take another minute or two uh, to wrap up. Okay, thank you. Um, so I'll just uh, thank you for the encouragement to share our work. Uh, and so I'd like to do that. Um, and I want to, because I especially want to announce here uh, for the first time that uh, in honor of the 25th anniversary, I am launching a new program. And uh, because it's limited space, I wanted to give everyone here first, ah, first uh, to hear it first. And it is a, it's going to be a nine month, why are you doing this? <laughs> I'll take my hand off the mouse. Okay, so I'm launching a new nine-month Lilith's Fire leadership program, and uh, it'll be an immersion into our own soul journeys through spiritual autobiography and deepening our intuition, uh, identifying and expanding our leadership skills, and of course, working with Lilith and the work of Audre Lorde and living wisdom holders. Um, my email, which you would suggest that we share, is devora at Lilith Institute. And uh, you can also find me and also Kohenet Annie Matan on our Tending Lilith's Fire channel um, on uh, YouTube. And I'm gonna just stop sharing here. And uh, on my website, lilithinstitute.com, information about upcoming speakers and classes and so on. Many thanks, Yeshe, and wonderful to be here and share this all with you. Thank you so much. And, and sisters, I don't know if, if you know, if you haven't, traveled broadly in um, the Jewish feminist community. You might not know it, but we are here in the presence of greatness. Um, <laughs> Deborah is one of the people who re resurrected the term Kohenet for Jewish priestesses in modern usage. She developed an entire curriculum around it when no one else was doing so. And there are literally hundreds, if not thousands of Jewish women today and women like myself who might have some Jewish ancestry but are not practicing that now, weren't raised in it. 
we have been able to make really some amazing connections through your work. Thank you so much, Devorah, for being Thank here you. with us today. Thank you. My pleasure. And please do um, stay in the chat in case.